how do you pronounce uh, pronounce your name correctly? Amo. Amo. Yeah. Amo. Amo. Uh, is it Amo as in like in love in Spanish? It's similar. It's similar. straight into it um uh, so if you can just introduce yourself and and the company that you're working uh with then that that'd be great yeah so my name is armor gutierrez and i'm an architect and um, i'm also an educator uh, living in between london and santander and right. i have been working um, in london for uh, seven years for competitors and fox and i have been uh, sharing the work that i do uh, with with the office internally and also with my students uh, at the University of East London, where I'm also teaching uh, part time and uh, soon starting uh, full time uh, in, as a senior lecturer. Okay, congratulations. In parallel, in parallel, I have as well a company that uh, is located in the north of Spain, uh, where we have a workshop, and we also operate in London. And we uh, run a program on model making and creative fabrication, where we welcome every year students from everywhere in the world. And we have a series of workshops during the summer where we experiment with different techniques and different materials, everything related to craftsmanship and to, we call it model making in the digital age. So we tend to mix uh, all the digital fabrication techniques that have been evolving more and more every year with the traditional crafts that mm. are somehow still very present in our day-to-day -day as architects, but the, the process that are leading to getting good results in architecture, sometimes they are not so well known by many practitioners. So we try to kind of bridge that gap and uh, as part of uh, that uh, kind of education uh, platform, we have also done a number of installations and exhibitions. Uh, one of them is the Love Without Borders that uh, I think we will talk uh, about it later that yes. uh, we developed for the London Festival of Architecture a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. No, it's awesome, uh, and then uh, I've, I've checked your videos out as well, like uh, how you how you molding things and like what material you use. It's really like I never seen anything like it. I'll be honest. So it's it's very very cool, very like colorful and stuff. I actually printed them out because I, I really wanted to sort of um, have a proper proper look at it as well. Um, so how how did like the whole like idea came about? How did you open the business and how but, but how did you know that there was like a niche for this kind of market and for for this kind of business i i, I have uh, i think that it came partially because of my professional practice so the um, during my work uh, at computers and fox at kpf i was uh, involved in the last phases of uh, many projects uh, dealing with contractors and with consultants and going to site uh, very often to review materials and to review processes of mm. making going to workshops as well and i realized that uh, that was knowledge that I acquired through a lot of kind of uh, experimentation and, and also a lot of testing with the different contractors, but it's not the knowledge that we usually get as in the architectural practice. So I thought that there was a kind of a need or, or, or a poten potential um, a kind of uh, experience that would be very useful for a lot of architects and for a lot of students, which will be getting to know how things are made, how the materials that we use are fabricated, what are their, their constraints, what are the uh, kind of efficient ways of producing, what does it mean that you create copies, whether it's on ceramics or in plaster or in wood, uh, how do we replicate these elements to create a facade, to create a composition, and as an architect, I know how important it is to be efficient and to be rational with your designs, especially now when the clients are looking to the budget almost to the millimeter. <laughs> so to me, to me, it was also like giving people the opportunity to learn these processes in a way that once you know the process, the conversation that you will have with the contractor is totally different. And that's something that we I always say to my students is like, Please learn the techniques, learn the material, work with them, even if you fail, but you will learn so much from the tactile process that when you speak to a contractor the next time, you are not going to be just the crazy architect designer that comes with something that is unbuildable, but you will really know, understand the constraints and you and that will benefit, you will benefit a lot. Your design will benefit a lot from that experience that you will gain. 
So I think that that was kind of the initial aim of the workshops. And then we kind of took a more experimental approach, uh, testing and experimenting with materials that we that were a bit more out of the market and that we think that could have potential uh, moving forward, especially materials that are mixing byproducts from different industries that have very low carbon footprint and that can perhaps lead into a, a bit of a change into the industry that at the moment is quite straightforward in the way we build. Sure, and then so so these these um, um, items that you create are they are they mostly used for installations or are they used for uh, sort of widespread construction? For example, you know if you have if you have like a, a large block of flats, would you would you would you incorporate a lot of these elements for a build think, like that? So, so far, we have tested in a small scale. So we have tested in installations and we have tested in small uh, renovations or small projects. But I think that uh, there is potential for this to develop further. And one of the uh, projects that we are researching uh, with my work in the University of East London is working with the um, bagasse, uh, which is a byproduct from uh, sugarcane. And there is a very large uh, factory, you might, you might know, Tate and Lyle, uh, that is located very close to the Royal Docks, that is close to where the university is. Okay. And they are very interested in experimenting with their byproducts to create construction materials. And it's already a research that has been going on for a couple of years. And we are trying to bring it more into the architectural realm to see how those materials could perhaps evolve into something that could be used for construction and something similar happened with the with hemp a few years ago there was a vision of including hemp into construction and there was a product that is called hemp crate that was created and now is used in construction is 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 not like very often that you see but you can use it you can select it it has very good environmental credentials and it has a very good thermal performance as well. So I think that is, is by, by doing these uh, kind of experiments and by testing and by pushing a bit harder, even if the first generation of experiments and prototypes is not going to go directly into industry. But I think that that requires that part of that process is that testing and that. And to me, something that I tell uh, my students as well, and that was trying to implement always in practice is uh, if you can test it, even if it's just for a specific part of the building, even if it's just like something that you just highlight, but that you also express it, you know, these materials, they look beautiful. And like the fact that people enter and they see, okay, this insulation is done with a material that is something different, you know, don't cover it, you know, leave it there and, and, and it can become a feature of the building. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's it's very interesting where where you know where you can actually uh, use byproducts to create something brand new and uh, innovative. Um, and obviously, you know, you, you can probably, um, uh, you know, keep the costs down. And obviously, the research probably costs a lot of money. You need to um, convince a lot of people that you know this product will actually do what you say it will. Um, so, with with this product, so, so the the pie byproduct of the sugar cane. So, what what what's the research? Do you know what what are they trying to create? What 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 type of product is it? Yeah, so what, what we are looking now is mainly uh, to use it for insulation, uh, so to, to kind of compress it and bind it uh, so it can be used as blocks uh, and then it can be installed internally so that it can be a substitute of uh, traditional insulation uh, and it can also uh, give some internal qualities to the space. So that's, that's the use that we are researching at the moment. I know that at the moment it's been already it's, it's already in industry for a lot of like cutlery dishes plates mm. that are using that product so we we are in a way what we want is to learn from that industry that is already there and try to apply it to construction that's very unusual and like very interesting because I, I don't really come across uh new products that much you know we, we're obviously in the construction industry ourselves and we essentially buy what what the architects normally specify or what we design mm. and, and build so, but it's it's normally off the shelf products, and we essentially look for uh, quality and price combination, uh, and and especially like brands. Brands is a big thing because you know when, when there's a brand, you know that the quality is there, and you can rely on them. Whereas obviously, if it's something completely brand new, you know you install uh, some sort of insulation made from a byproduct of sugarcane, for example, you don't know what's what's going to happen, and then are you going to get sued in two in two years and and all the yeah, rest? Yeah, that's, so. that, that's always that's always the risk. That's always the risk. I think that that's why. Uh, academia and universities they offer a platform to to test this to do initial kind of experiments uh, out of it and, and then like once that's 
test it and, and agree like the same with hemp crates. Now is a product that people know that is being tested and used for years in buildings. And but in, in the end, it takes just one brief client to say, "I want to try it," <laughs> and, and, yeah. and and then you know uh, people realize that is uh, that is a product that you can use. But I think that. It also, to me, is also triggering the curiosity of people and, and saying, okay, if they are testing this, what else can we test with which other materials? Hmm. And, and I think that is just yes, having that discussion and that dialogue that uh, selecting what you use is important. And many times as architects, we just select what was selected before. So when you are working yeah. in practice, it's very easy to... Uh, in a way take uh, another project and just say okay what did they use the, here it worked we use the same and when you deal with contractors uh, i have been working for many years with can i work contractors uh, first in can i work and then in woodworth and you tend to always get the same answer you know like we have to test it at least three times to to use it you know like if, if you can prove me that it's been tested three times in three projects successfully then I will I will be happy uh, to, to to implement it in, in in a new project. So it's it's very difficult to get into that scale of projects, which I also understand because you want to have something that is uh, certified, that is kind of certain that is going to work. But I think that more and more we need to be flexible and we need to be innovative in the way we select and we use our materials. And I think that this type of research can give an opportunity for either now or in a few years start to just think outside the box when it comes to materiality, when it comes to insulation, when it comes to finishes. And some people are pushing for that direction. And there is like uh, lately a lot of cork being used in construction. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of wood uh, being used in construction as well. So there are yeah. materials that are already there. So I think we just need to kind of widen our, our selection range and try to make the best out of it. Yeah, and we need a lot of creative people like you, like yourself, uh, for for these things because a lot of people would look at something and they'll be like, okay, well, just, that just waste. So they just discard of it, and that's the end of story. I'm sure that uh, byproduct of sugarcane has been discarded for many, many years until someone thought, well, hold on, maybe we can actually reuse it. And um, mm -hmm. it's a bit off the topic, but like I just remembered um, something I saw. Um, it was like on TV or, or social media or whatever. There was the, the, there was this Indian village and then they had a lot of fish. So they were the, scaling the fish and gutting the fish. They had loads of fish skin left and they were just discarding and it was everywhere. So it was like a bit of a problem as well as, you, you know, just loads of waste. And then this guy just came up and he was like, well, why don't we try to make clothes out of it? And everyone's like, you're mad. Like, there's no, there's no way you can do it. And after, I don't know how many years, he was testing and trying and doing all kinds of things and and dyeing it and and and, and drying it and whatever he actually succeeded and then it became like a thing in india and it's probably not not only in india it's probably you know elsewhere as well but that that guy like, made it work something that every like you know anyone anyone rational would look at it like what are you doing why why, why are you playing with trash but he, he managed to do that and there was another guy he was um he, he managed to do very low cost uh, hygiene products for women it was also, and it was like to do with just circumstances that he was like, you know, his wife was struggling and he, you know, he was like, well, you know, there, there must be a better way of doing things in a cheaper way. And, uh, you know, people always find a way. And, uh, and the last, the last thing literally saw a couple of dates, but it's, it's kind of, again, off, off, off the topic, but it's, it's just like the, the development of a product. Obviously the Viagra has been, uh, for men that was, that was, um, design and, and manufactured i think it's like 1960s 1970s it was a big thing and it, and, it, and it sort of went through the uh for the government body really really quickly so it's like within i think it was six to eight months it got approved by fda and then it was like off to the off to the races you know it was you know selling out like crazy and then uh, this woman who now i believe is a billionaire now she came up with with the same with a similar product but for for women and you know you think why the why the hell would you need one but she came up with a product and fda didn't want to give her uh, uh the, the the permit the you know the fda certification so she's been battling with them for like six years um, and apparently this product is super successful you know it, you know it, it you know it's it's in use massively you know women take advantage of it so is it like there's, there's always ways to improve things is what i'm trying to get at there's always things yeah, that yeah. you know for for most people would be like well it's just a waste of time or it's impossible or it's not necessary and whatever to be honest you, you know with the headphones um when they when they came out without a cord i was like what where the hell do you need them like you can just put like a head and now i can't live without them literally like i always <laughs> stick in my in my ears like how, how could i live without these because they're so convenient 
because uh, it's a lot convenient yeah. than like holding a phone to your ear or having those things you know dangling dangling around so um so it, it's it's amazing I, I, I also think that there is like a lot of experimentation that is a positive uh, it's always bringing positive aspects to the profession no like i think that having like the possibility to test new materials and to uh, research uh, how can we make the world more sustainable through materiality i think that that's something quite important i i, I wanted to mention as well a couple of um, projects that is some of our students are looking into it uh, one of them is using uh, mycelium as insulation as well which is a uh, is, is, is kind of a fungi that grows uh, using byproducts from uh, crops from grass so like any waste from agriculture and then it's kind of binding this waste together and then you just put it into a oven i think it's at around 180 degrees and when you bake it it stays in that shape and now it's been used quite a lot for packaging to replace uh, styrofoam and to kind of because you can mold it to any geometry that you want and we are seeing how can you push this material to be used for construction as well so i think that at the end is like uh, keeping an open mind and keeping a, a bit like when you, when you want to kind of try an experiment but uh, as a contractor or as an architect that you are just working in practice is a bit difficult because you are all the time within a budget and you want to kind of as you said go into products that are already there but this experimentation i think that can bring also some very special results and i think that in that regard um, the london festival of architecture gives a very good platform mm. to test these ideas because they engage with different companies and different institutions to create temporary installations whether they are pavilions, benches, installations, or now they are designing a school as well. But I think that they are really open to this sort of experimentation and they really value when people try new things, even if they don't always achieve the best results. And I think that uh, having these kind of platforms where you can express uh, new ideas and, and new thinking is, is something very powerful. So that I think that that, that uh, in a way ties with one of the projects that we developed for the London Festival of Architecture that uh, we can we can discuss. Uh, yes, later. please, let's discuss. Yeah. Tell us all about it. Yeah, so I, 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 I have developed two different projects. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, called Love Without Borders. Uh, that was uh, the London Festival of Architecture 2019. And it was um, the theme of the festival that year was boundaries. So it was a bit uh, trying to highlight the issue of new walls being built every year. Uh, I think that at the moment we are in the moment in history where we have more kilometers of walls between countries and every year keeps on adding uh, almost like 10% of length. So it's not something that is like boundaries are not uh, being open, they are being closed, uh, especially uh, the like kind of, as we know, the prototypes that Trump uh, may build for the world with Mexico, but mm. also many other walls around the world that we are not aware and they are just being built every, every year. And the idea was that the installation was trying to um, somehow provoke uh, to, to, to say, okay, the installation is shaped as a wall. So mm. it's taking the profile of a concrete wall, but then there is a window for social interaction that is shaped like a heart. So the idea is that the wall is there, but by interacting from one side to another of the wall, you can create that dialogue in between um, different people that are passing in different areas. And the fact that it was installed in the city of London, where you always have people that have no time, they are like kind of rushing around. And so, and, and then giving that possibility of sitting there, sitting inside the wall and reflecting on what's, what, 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 does, what does a wall mean? What does that boundary mean? And how can we minimize the impact or, 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 or make it in a, in a very playful way? And it was exhibited in uh, the city of London for I think it was three or four months during the, during the summer time. And now uh, we donated it to a local school in Dalich uh, and the kids uh, love it. So they have made it uh, almost like the icon of the, of the, of the school, which is, wow. which is quite nice. Congratulations, yeah. that's amazing. Changing, so that was, changing that was, lives all over. 
Yeah, and I think that with the the, the kids, they they show it also. I, I like they we we explain the concept to them, and they I think that they understood when we, when we explain it. But they, they see it as a as a playground, so they are climbing around and they are climbing the wall and going up and down and, and playing with the heart, which I think is quite is quite a, is quite exciting. And then the second installation that they, I have developed for the London Festival of Architecture as well, it was for last year, so it was two thousand and twenty. And it was a competition called Sitting Pretty, which was inviting emerging architects and designers to uh, design benches for the main railway stations in London. So they installed five uh, benches in total uh, in the five main stations uh, across across the across London. Mine was installed in London Bridge, and then it was a very nice initiative. They brought all the benches together to London Bridge, and then there was an exhibition with all of them. And I think that that was probably the project where I managed to test uh, the ideas that uh, I was kind of uh, having in mind with the students and doing uh, in the university the most, uh, because I, I, I did the whole project using reclaimed uh, wooden slippers. So it was a bit the metaphor of, you know, like wooden slippers are being replaced by concrete uh, everywhere in the country. And most of the time they are just dismissed or they are used for creating like kind of steps or fences, but it's very rare that you see furniture that is made out of the actual material. So I thought that uh, that material had a lot of value because it had a history of almost 200 years. In many cases, it's very good quality oak. And even if around it has this kind of layer of uh, dark uh, varnish that they have applied over and over to protect it, inside the wood is still there as the first time. So it was quite a beautiful moment when we were in the workshop and we cut the wood in two and we saw the interior of the wood and we realized how beautiful the material was. And then the idea was to combine uh, that kind of reclaimed wood with the um, digital manufacture. So we created with a CNC machine in collaboration with a local contractor in London, uh, with Shadwell Veneers, mm -hmm. that they very kindly uh, offered their support to create the molds. So we did the molds uh, using MDF and then using a steam bending, which is basically taking the oak wood that is like 200 years without moving. You just made it a slice and then you put it into a steam and the steam gets into the fiber of the wood. And after a couple of hours, the wood is quite flexible. Oh. So then you put it out of the steam bending machine, you apply pressure from both ends, and then you get the wood to adapt to the geometry that you want. So combining those different geometries, we managed to create these uh, benches. It was a set of three modules that could be then multiplied into more modules and that that can be arranged in different configurations on the stations. And the idea was also that the shape that we selected, the curve that we selected was inspired by the shape of the stations. So when you are in Google Earth and you look at the trace of the station in the city, the stations, they have a very strong trace because when they get into the city, they branch out and then they occupy a lot of space. Mm -hmm. And now they are being regenerated in London. You know, like there's been so much effort, especially London Bridge put so much effort into regenerating the public realm and opening as many bridges as possible to allow permeability. So it was in a way celebrating that regeneration uh, that informed the, the geometry of the bench. So it was a combination of several aspects, but uh, to me, like the, the key aspect was that if, if I if if I were to, to 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 win the competition, I said, okay, if I if I do it, I want to fabricate it myself. I don't want to sub hire. I don't want to contract anybody. I want mm -hmm. to do as much as possible uh, in the workshop. So I learn about the material. I learn about the technique, and in a way, I'm able to explain it better, like what we are doing now. And you've obviously done a fantastic job because people appreciate it. You know, you know yeah, people said really good things. And I I saw it myself as well. That it looks you know very unusual, very very cool looking and and the, obviously the material that you use is is uh you, unique in a way how, how you sort of done the manufacturing process and how you sort of twisted it and and uh managed to do what you did so yeah i mean it's it, it, it's it's really cool um and going to the first um item what you spoke about um you know representing the the walls and the number of walls that are going up every year and everything else and uh, you've mentioned the trump wall and it sort of sprung into uh, my mind a video of so obviously they've done it pa partially right so they're still doing that wall um mm -hmm. and it's and it's quite high it's about i would say about 10 meters or thereabout and uh, it was a video and then literally a car pulled up four guys came out and they they just used like ropes and ladders and things like that. And the guy was over the wall. And I'm not kidding you. In about 15 seconds, 15 seconds. 
So I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> it's just, I, yeah. I, I think, I think it's just a symbol. Like, okay, America and Mexico, you know, we're not friends. Here's a wall. This is this is a gate. You can't come in. Again, you know, some sort of a, um, you know, moral moral dilemma. I guess um, it, it's yeah. it's obviously sad that that that's happening. And uh, when he announced it, I think everyone was like, "Why? Why? Why? Why, why the hell would you do that?" But obviously, you know, it went ahead. It went ahead. Um, so uh, going back to your business, um, so I believe you have some uh, uh, partners as well, and you have a brother. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So, so I am... how, how how's working with family? How's it? How's it? It has uh, pros and cons. <laughs> well, it's okay. I, I, yeah, I I think that uh, is is really special because the um, I mean it's, it's my brother and it's my father as well. Um, okay. My father is a visual is a visual artist in 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 the north of Spain and and he's been we were living where he had the workshop so it was a house and a workshop all together uh, in Santander very close to the sea. It was a fantastic place to grow up and we go there every summer where we have the summer school and he. Uh, was always uh, trying to teach us as much as possible on what he knew on techniques that we could apply to architecture, especially through model making and through prototyping when we were doing our degree and our masters in Madrid. My brother is an architect as well. So we kind of learn a lot from him and we owe, we owe a lot to him. And I think that it was really special for us when we were uh, doing work for the university with our father because it was always resulting in something very unique that uh, people at the university didn't see before and it was in a way getting a lot of attention and a lot of credit and that was in a way the the, the beginning of a very good relationship and the beginning of uh, the, the the business that we have now together and what we did was basically say, okay, we have been working in a way we have been working together for a while already because we have been collaborating uh, in different in different aspects. And what if we try to mix what we know with what our father knows and, and try to combine in both of them, uh, get something that is uh, new and fresh. And, and my father explains everything very well with his hands and, and, and mm. he's, he, he, he's been teaching uh, ceramics and, and engraving for many years. He's still uh, teaching in a local school in Santander. And he started as a ceramist. And I think that when you see people that work with ceramics very well, work with their hands, like you learn much more about the touching experience and about seeing the hands than about explaining anything. So we, we kind of, uh, we, we, we were trying to combine it in a way that we will add as much as possible related to architecture and see how all these materials and technique that my father was developing for years could mm. be applied into, into, into architecture. And it, it works very well. I think that when we organize, uh, the, the main activity that we do together is the, is the summer school of uh, digital fabrication and model making. And there is my father, my brother, and myself, the three of us. And we get always like between 10 and 15 students from everywhere in the world. Uh, my father communicates, uh, he doesn't speak English very well, but he communicates very well with his hands. We communicate as much as possible on our expertise and our domains. But I think we combining the work of the three of us, it, it kind of ties together very nicely. And my brother is currently working in Berlin uh, for Herzog and the Meuron. Um, quite an important practice and uh, it's an opportunity as well to see each other basically to spend some time together to catch up to see what have been doing in parallel and, and then of course uh, for certain projects we also come together and do them together but sometimes we do them individually it depends a bit on the on the timing and where we are at that time but as you can see uh, we are in three different locations and we try to develop work both locally where we are but also together in Santander so even before lockdown, we were doing a lot of work online. We were doing a lot of um, collaborations and, and meetings and part of the workshops, even we were doing all that uh, digitally. And last year, again, for the London Festival of Architecture, we organized a workshop on uh, casting, silicon molds and, and, and casting techniques uh, mm -hmm. to, to learn uh, to use few casting materials. And it was in the middle of the pandemic, so we couldn't do it. We, normally, we would do it physically in London in mm -hmm. a shop that is called 4D Model Shop that um, uh, has a lot of products on model making and a lot of architectural students go there to create their, their designs. 
and they have a number of arches and we were going to an arch. It was impossible. So we said, okay, how can we do it in a different way? So we, we came up with the idea to create a package of uh, materials and, you know, like a bit samples of each one of the materials in a very nicely uh, packed box. And we would send those boxes out to the different participants. And then uh, I was having a box myself. So we will open the box together and we will start to do the workshop live. This year we are organizing the second edition, so I'm hoping for a, for a fun day as well. And it was a great success. We had people joining from UK, from Ireland. We have some people joining from uh, Europe as well. You know, once you think it's not just only people in London, then you open uh, to almost everybody the, the possibilities to participate. And it worked very well. It was, uh, of course, you miss a bit the social interaction, but still you have like it was 20 people at the same time with it, with it through Zoom. So you would see everybody at the same time. Then each result was shown in the camera. I think it was quite a, quite an interesting experience. So I think that despite the fact that, uh, I'm sorry, I got a bit out of topic, but despite the fact that we are not together and that we are not able to communicate every day, I think that there are ways of, of arranging and, and of collaborating, even if you are different locations and, and even if you are kind of having different agendas as well. Yeah, it's it, it's like finding a way, isn't it? And uh, you, you made it fun. Everyone participated. You had a great time, and uh, yeah, that that that's what counts. And uh, I, I think entertainment in general is very important. And uh, if if you can uh, make something that's important as well, uh, entertaining, then you know people people are going to take it in uh, a lot better rather than if you make it boring. Um, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, so it looks like you have an international stage now, yeah, all over the all over Europe, Spain, UK, Germany, and uh, you collab collaborating on on projects all, all the time um, together. Well, like obviously, and, yeah. and, and and I guess in summer more than the rest of the year. Yeah, in summer, especially because in Santander in summer the weather is nicer. <laughs> so yeah, we, yeah. We, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So you probably don't and go there during the year, right? You just go for for the good for the good weather. For the wood part, yeah. <laughs> 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 that that's well i mean who, who can blame you the the weather here is, is not particularly great is it but you know what can you do um uh, so in, in terms of obviously you know going, going back to the business model and how things started for you um so so um your brother and yourself so have, have you sort of have you chosen um similar careers uh so obviously we're both architects but do you do you specialize in very similar things and does does that help with the business yeah, I, th I think I think so as well. Yeah, I think that we are we are both of us, or we. In my, in my case, uh, I am a bit older, so I have a bit more of experience in international practice. But we, we thought that it was important first to begin knowing how other practices were operating. So I was working. I work in Denmark for a couple of years. I was working in the Netherlands for three years, and uh, and now in London. So just to test a bit how different practices have different approaches to design and. And I think that that really helped me as well to um, set up my, my own uh, kind of uh, agenda, my own workshops and my own kind of uh, set of skills. And I think that I owe a lot to all these companies that I have been uh, working with. But now looking back, I think that what is, is not only like learning from like how uh, companies and practices operate, but also the human experience that you create there. And I have been quite lucky that uh, it was always working with, uh, with outstanding people. <laughs> so I, I was uh, always able to, very international, but also very young, very talented, very enthusiastic about design and about testing and experimenting. And I think that that got me into, uh, in a way, like seeing how really good set of people were uh, coming every year to practices with a lot of enthusiasm. It got me inspired as well to start uh, the making school and to start my teaching in the university because in a way you are always in contact with the with whoever is coming new, with new ideas, with the, with new proposals, with new energy and, and starting collaborations with these younger generations. So I think that it keeps you really active and it keeps you very engaged and I think that of course, there is a lot of value as well on staying for a long time and, and getting a lot of experience in certain practices. But I think that the fact that you can 
uh, now, in my case, seeing it in retrospective, and, and I can then reach out to quite a wide network uh, in, in Europe, not only friends, but also for, for collaborations or for uh, developing projects together. And my brother is similar, you know, he's, he's more like kind of based in Germany, so he has a very good network there. And, and, and I think that kind of putting it together, uh, it's uh, an additional strength to it. Yeah, complements. And I think that, yeah, it complements very well. To, to us, like most of the collaborations that we have done, they have came out of people that has found on the website the work that we do, or the summer workshops, or uh, the, the schools, or, or, or kind of collaborations that we have done. And they are intrigued by the approach or by the fact that we offer something that is slightly different from formal education that is more tactile, more one-to-one, -one, more like getting your hands dirty. Mm. And they have then get in touch with us and then propose to do further collaborations. And I think that like through this sort of starting like with one person that comes to your workshop and sees what you do and then decides maybe this is interesting for our university would you mind coming to our university for a couple of weeks giving a lecture there giving a workshop and i think that that's when it becomes very rich when when you go out of what you do and where you do it and you you bring your skills somewhere else and i think that that's very common for like contractors that are always like kind of going from side to side but like in sometimes in practice you are in your place and unless you are supervising a work you might be in the same office days and days and not really leave the office and uh, that's great to some extent because the office is still offering like a lot of interest in uh, materials and designs but like being able to export your knowledge and to meet people outside your circle i think that's quite important as well we were invited i think it was three years ago to doha to qatar for a Biennale of Design that was called Tasmin, and they do it every every two years. And it was a fantastic experience, yes, being able to go to a country that has a totally different culture, a university that educates people from almost like 20 Arabic countries, which we, we went there without knowing very well which type of uh, education, which type of approach would they have to, to design. And we were fascinated by the kind of sensibility that they have developed by the amount of, particular, the amount of uh, ladies that were like taking part in the workshops and with so much enthusiasm and like kind of uh, wanted to then take what they learn and then uh, start like uh, mini companies. And I think that was probably one of the most rewarding trips that and um, experiences that we did because we were there for, I think it was 10 days in total. We did two workshops in parallel and one lecture, and mm -hmm. we have now so many connections from there that have started a small either businesses or teaching experiences or even teaching at the university using what they learn with us. And to me, that, that's super rewarding. You know, just to see that you can expand and that you can extrapolate what you know from where you are to other locations. Yeah, of course, it's passing wisdom, isn't it? Teaching others, yeah. you know, yeah. it's 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 kind of building your legacy in a way, and mm -hmm. uh, and you're doing that all over the world by the looks of it. Yeah, and, and I think that like traditionally is something that you were doing, like you know, like as a craftsmanship, you would like enter as an apprentice and be there two or three years, learn it, and then go somewhere else and then teach maybe one or two more people throughout the, your trajectory. But I think that now, especially with COVID, that has kind of changed totally. The perspective and, and now it's not like you don't go to a place anymore right like you can go to a lot of places at the same time so and i think that that that's a that that's something that despite the the, the, the horrible situation that we are that we are still living but it, it has uh, offered a lot of opportunities to explore this uh, different ways of teaching or engaging or, or reaching people yeah with COVID, hopefully the, the the good days are around the corner fingers crossed you never know. Um, yeah. let, let, let's talk about uh, any of the ongoing projects that you have. Um, if, if I'm not mistaken, you are involved in a skyscraper in Canary Wharf. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it's uh, it's not Canary Wharf. It's Woodworth, but it's Canary Wharf. Uh, right. It's the Canary Wharf area, Canary Wharf Group. And it's a residential scheme. Um, and uh, I have been working in the project for... Uh, almost a year and a half now uh, is uh, going into a stage three uh, in the next couple of weeks and I was heavily involved during the stage two and during the design of the facade the design of the cladding working with the 
cladding contractors, uh, working with Canary Wharf and working with a number of consultants and material suppliers. And to me, it's been quite uh, exciting to uh, kind of be able to once again work with the same group of people, but with a different, with, with a more kind of a senior, if you want, a, a, a approach to the, mm -hmm. to the design and knowing, because I, I, I did a couple of projects before uh, with Canary Wharf uh, while working at KPF and they were uh, both of them uh, like kind of uh, office towers and quite a straightforward. And this is residential, which gives you a bit more of flexibility and uh, like the design can be a bit more intriguing. Mm -hmm. And I think that we did a very good job into bringing the knowledge that we gained from the initial projects into into the into the new one. And yeah, it's it's going to be probably going to site next year and it's quite uh, it's quite exciting so i'm looking forward to see it uh, to see it move uh, up from the ground yeah. the basement is uh, they are developing the whole basement of woodwork at once and now uh, they are starting with the with the with the structure of the basement so you can leave a foot 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 footprint on, a, on an amazing landmark in in london how how, how great would that be hopefully let's see when when i will yeah. i'm sure it'll happen i'm sure it'll happen there's a reason why you're there in the first place so uh, I'm, I'm sure yeah. you're going to be involved from you know from small things to major things you know on that project i'm sure um and um so in terms of construction so you said obviously you lays with the subcontractors and contractors in general and things like that so how, how's your overall experience and what kind of stage are you only uh, normally involved in so I have been involved uh, mainly in later stages, so stage four, stage five. Like I, I, I like starting projects as early as possible. So like a stage two, a stage three. So you control from the beginning uh, all the different parameters that that is that you know like the design can be uh, improved or or rationalized in a way that everything uh, is going to be easier to build and to construct in the next stages. And I think that that's something quite important that sometimes we forget as architects and a lot of projects get not built because the architect was not able to say at some point, okay, this is the design, but this is the reality. How can we match both of them? Mm. So I, I, I like to be part of that process. And, and, and I think that it's important that we understand the the that every line that we draw will have an implication cost wise material wise environmental wise so that we need to be very careful that it's not the same having 10 panels that are the same size that having 10 panels which each one of them with a different size that it, it seems that is very similar in your drawing but then in reality it's probably three times more expensive and sometimes you don't even see it when you build it yeah. you know like so i think that is being able to know where the importance of the architecture and the design is and having very clear that there is a set of elements that you need to respect and that you need to work towards and that you need to kind of uh, enhance and highlight in the project but then there are many other elements that by just tweaking slightly the design you can get into a much more efficient and a much more um, while keeping the the, the the integrity of the design but you can get into something that is much more buildable basically and i think that i like to me like getting involved into those stages where you transform an idea like a very simple massing idea into an actual set of plans that can be built that to me that's very rewarding and and like the main experience that i have got is being on, on on facades on cladding and i think that like to me like being able to deal with the contractors uh, directly like uh, traveling to germany to see the factories where they do most of the cladding uh, selecting the glass making sure that all the elements are like as per our design intent and, and then traveling back to UK and seeing how the panels come and they get installed super quickly is like such an efficient way of, of, of building and that to, to me that's a, that, that's been the main um, focus and the main reward from what I have been doing in the last uh, few years. Mm. I mean, there's no doubt, you know, being an architect is very, you know, it's a very important position. So obviously any mistakes or any, um, any things that might be overlooked can cost, you know, like you said, thousands and thousands of pounds, right? And then obviously that, that, that hits the client and the client's not happy. And then the, 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 the build might be 
you know, uh, behind schedule and all the rest of it. So yeah, I, I mean, the the importance of it. I, I, I don't I don't know how you sleep at night, to be honest. <laughs> simply simply because there's so many decisions, so many things that sort of uh, you know rely on you and depend on you and your expertise and 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 just like uh, I guess the time management and just putting putting things. And, and and sort of uh, ma making sure that you can sort of um, get everything done in in one go and make sure that all of it is correct is just it's just immense pressure, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that people tend to collaborate a lot, and I think that that's uh, something very good. And I learn that that a lot in UK as well. Like I think that here there are so many consultants and subconsultants and like mm. sometimes it's a bit too much but at the same time it mm. gives you the possibility to engage with like so many experts and to seek opinion from different sides and, and i think that's very positive i think that that's a to me it's a profession that requires being able to collaborate in a daily basis you know you always need to it's not that you design something and that's how it's going to be you need to mm seek opinion you need to like share your thoughts share your like every, everything you do can can be improved to some extent you know yes by talking to the right people and that's something that uh, i i really enjoy like uh, you know like being able to design but then modify and adapt your design because you have a number of experts that are influencing and that are inputting on what you're doing yeah so where do you draw inspiration for all of these projects do, do you sort of research uh you know internet in general social media do, do you sort of talk to your father and brother and then sort of you know thinking about new shapes and colors and materials how does this sort of yeah, go I, about I, I think that it's a, it's a it's a combination of of different aspects i think that we do a lot of research on uh, referencing the work of uh, masters of architecture that we like Mm -hmm. uh, we, we we like a lot like uh, the Spanish school of architecture and we we use it as a reference uh, in, in our work uh, also uh, sculptures and artists I think that we we really like to draw inspiration from from our work uh, current artwork and also historical artwork I think that that's for us is a source of inspiration always and I think that then every project needs to be really specific to its location as well and having a uh, sort of a social agenda for the project that can uh, somehow inform the design and that can help you to take the right decisions and i think that like being able to see a project that really belongs to the place where it sits is really important sometimes we see the same copy of building here and there and you don't really know why it's really located there like but i think that when the building is really rooted to its place it becomes a very successful building and I'm like, for instance, uh, I have been like I live very close in Santander to Bilbao, to the to the city in the vast country, and I have seen the transformation of Bilbao with the Guggenheim Museum, and I think that that's that's a building that sits very well where it is because it was a warehouse area with a lot of kind of harbor activity, a lot of metal, a lot of like kind of almost the shape of the museum could come out of the work that they were doing there. And it's a, it's, a, it's a country that, or a region in Spain that has a lot of heritage working with metal. And I think that that, to me, that work is, is really inspiring. But sometimes when I see a similar building in another city in a totally different context, I wonder whether like, you know, like something that works very well for a certain context, when you put it somewhere else, is not so ideal. So I think that like, even the work from the same architect, depending on where you have it and what's the relationship with the city where it sits, it can be from something that is extremely successful to something that is there but is not telling you much. So I think that to me, like uh, inspiration is super important, but also making sure that the building is related to and, and belongs to the place where it sits. Sure, because obviously they, they, they need to kind of look, the, not, not the same, but they have to have certain features so that they, I mean, I don't know how it is in Spain, but obviously in, in, in UK, there's a lot of that. So, you know, if you have a street that where the houses look all the same in terms of, you know, the the, the mm -hmm. roof pitch or the, you know, the, 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 the driveway or the type of windows or whatever, you know, typically you need to install very similar products. So you can't like go bananas and, and, and do something completely uh, different yeah, yeah. going back to Bilbao because I, I believe I've been there so is, is that is that where the coast is is like a horseshoe shape or was that something there uh, well the bay 
I think that because Bilbao is by a river, so the so the the, the city of Bilbao is up river by like 10 kilometers, so you don't get to the sea. But there is a, another city. Okay. There is another city that is called San Sebastian. Maybe you are ah, referring no. to that. That's exactly where and, it was. Yeah, yeah. Cause, cause that, I, that one, yeah, go on. That one has a beautiful bay that is shaped as a, right. a, as yeah, a yeah. San one. Sebastian. That's right. Yeah. yeah exactly. w- whenever we do the summer school, we do trips to Bilbao or San Sebastian because they are very close, and the whole that whole area is, is really beautiful. And in San Sebastian, there is a, an installation by a, a sculpture that is called Chigida that is called El Peine de los Vientos, which translates as the, the calm of the wind. Mm. And mm. it's also like really very, like really well rooted to its place. It's like at the end of that walk that you were describing, there is a place where the walk ends and it meets the sea and then the, the urban becomes nature. It's, it's exactly in that moment because you go from being able to walk in a paving into, into a cliff that has been untouched for many years. And that's where the sculpture sits and it plays with the wind. So when the water comes in, it produces different sounds. And also it's, 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 it was done with like very large uh, steel pieces that were bending like almost in place. So he went to the workshop and to the factory and he said, okay, I want you to start bending this until I say stop. So he didn't do a design and send it to anyone. He went there and did the design while the piece was being fabricated. And to me, uh-huh. that's also really beautiful and, and it very inspiring, not only the result, but also the process that got uh, to that result. Yeah, it was the, yeah. now that you said that it's definitely, it was San Sebastian because I've done that walk yeah, and, yeah. I, and I remember, yeah, it's, it's, it's urban obviously for, for a while and then it starts to sort of blend into more N- mm-hmm. like nature uh nature and yeah. then the, yeah i don't think there was a payment anymore um in terms of um the the work that you do as a senior lecturer so do you want to join us tell us about that a little bit yeah of course i have been <laughs> i think this is my fourth year in the university of east london and we have a group of students uh, we are called unit eight um, we have a, an Instagram site that is becoming very popular lately okay. and where we publish, the, we publish the work of the students. And we have been, um, I, I teach uh, alongside my, my partner uh, and we have been uh, for, I think that we have been abroad two years and in London uh, two years. So we try to go uh, one year out and one year here. This year we are working in the Royal Docks, uh, very close to where the university sits and we are exploring how to revitalize the waterfront of the Royal Docks. And to me, I think that the very exciting opportunity is that you are able to throw ideas to improve the city or to improve the social fabric and to improve the, the, the way people use the public space. And we always encourage our students to really engage with uh, the local community and understand what are the needs and how can they be improved. And then through proposals that are very careful with the environment and that try to kind of rewild always the the, the areas where they operate uh, while proposing architectural solutions, but always taking care that nature uh, comes back into the into into the into the urban. So we uh, are looking very closely to sustainable materials, to treatment of water, to water reeds that can filter the water without the need of uh, uh, using like very costly uh, sewage uh, infrastructure. Um, how can we also clean there? We work uh, a couple of years ago, we work in, in Skopje in North Macedonia. Uh, we did a collaboration with the university and we did a study trip there and it's one of the most polluted cities in the world uh, because it has a lot of traffic and uh, mixed with industry and a lot of people that are still burning solid fuels to heat their houses and we push the students to deliver solutions that uh, through either the facade of the building or the way the building was designed yeah. could uh, somehow uh, clean and improve the air quality so we had uh, i think it was in total uh, 12 projects and they were all proposing innovative solutions to clean the air and to sometimes it was just cleaning the air, sometimes it was cleaning the air and highlighting the issue. We had one student that had a fantastic project that was a museum of pollution and you would enter the museum wearing a mask because the whole museum was having pollution levels, like the highest pollution level of one day in Skopje was in the museum so you could experience how harm 
how much harm could that do to, to yourself? So we are always trying to mix a social agenda and environmental agenda and trying to push the students to think a bit uh, how can architecture improve both aspects. Yeah, that's extremely interesting. And uh, I, th I think there's obviously a lot of people out there that are trying to improve the, the air quality, the obviously getting all the plastic out of the oceans and, and things like that. So it's, you know, it's very inspiring individuals and, uh, you know, best of luck to them and best of luck to your students, because hopefully they'll yeah. <laughs> succeed and, 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 you know, reach amazing, amazing heights. Um, so what, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's sort of just starting um, um, their career and they want to get into architecture and, and maybe something similar that you do? <sighs> That's a tricky one. I think that probably my main advice would be to collaborate, to reach out to other students, to other colleagues, to people that you know in the industry, to tell them that uh, you are available to uh, do projects together, to work with them, to learn from them, to uh, understand uh, their approach. And I think that like to me, like most of the opportunities that I had and everything that I have developed is always coming from a collaboration with someone or from uh, knowing someone through uh, either uh, knowing the work or being interested in the work or so I think that keeping an open mind and, and, and making sure that you always uh, highlight and, 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 and in, in, in a way, I think that it's, it's, it's more about a curious approach to, to, to architecture and, and not just thinking that you will be just sitting in, the, in your house and the projects will come to you, but you really need to, especially now more than ever, you really need to go out and look for it. And sometimes it's uh, with one person, sometimes it's with two people, sometimes it's within a big practice, sometimes it's uh, attending a lecture in a school. But I think that the more that collaboration network is expanded, the, the richer the experience will be. And to me, it has helped a lot, of course, uh, developing with my brother and my father, the project that we have done, but also with all the people that I have uh, met along the way. And not only architects, but also like a lot of projects that they have done, they have been very successful because I have done it with contractors, contractors that really know what they are doing and, and sometimes they are just very interested into developing and exploring different things. And, and I think that that's something that I will really encourage everyone to, to, to think outside the box and to say, okay, let's try to get directly to the creative process and to the making process. Let's not just stay behind our computers and hide there and yeah. send the drawing to someone else. Let's get as much as possible involved into, into the process. Yeah, I guess being personal, being proactive, right? Um, you know, networking is, is, is key to any kind of business success, whether it's business or, or you know, being an entrepreneur, as in like work, working in a company. So I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, busy people are normally the more successful people just because they do so, so many things and they just yeah. put so much more yeah. time. I'm sure your days are crazy, you know, uh, <laughs> in terms of how, how much time you spend on, 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 on your business and then uh, at the university as well. So I, th I, th I think that's the key, you know, grit, grit and uh, time management is very important uh, and networking. So you, you need to know people. So like, you know, in our industry, it's very important just to, just to know professionals, you know, lawyers and, and, and consultants and architects, instruction engineers and, and building control, all, all sorts of people. And obviously over time you get to know it, um, but you, I think you can succeed much quicker if you just put the time in and, and sort of um, do that early on and just make connections. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, even if you, if you have a LinkedIn account, you know, just connect with people and just talk to them. And then, you know, when, when something comes up, you can always collaborate, like you said, and, uh, you know, take advantage of, of your relationship and, and, you know, have a, like a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that yeah, so, social media really promotes this as well. No, like this, I think this podcast is a fantastic example, you know, yes, like Thanks. getting to reaching out to people and getting the word out and, and, you know, you never, you never know who is going to be listening, who is going to be interested and, and, and why. And I think that sometimes it's, it's like touching like many points and spreading as much as possible the word out and, and things end up happening. I know it, no, it's it's amazing. You can literally, you know, you can touch someone, uh, you know, from 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 a very long distance, you know, somewhere I don't know in Argentina, and they'll be like, oh yeah, like, these guys inspire me. I want I want to start something, you know, and, and they would just go and do it. So you never know. So I think spreading joy and, and good is 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 always better, and I think I think you should uh, concentrate on that because uh, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Peter uh, Jordan Peterson is he's a uh, 
he's actually famous right now. He's a psychiatrist by trade. Um, but uh, he, he was saying that um, any any one person knows at least a thousand people in their lifetime. So, so that that thousand people would know another thousand people. So that means a million. So you want one person from a million uh, or two people from a billion. So whatever you say, you think that might not matter, but actually it might matter like big time because like if you spread joy to a thousand people, that joy is likely to multiply and then it will multiply to others. If and if you be uh, uh, annoying, uh, <laughs> annoying and and uh, miserable bastard, then I don't think that's that's gonna make uh, any anyone happy in, in this world. So uh, yeah, joy, joy over over being uh, miserable for sure. Um, in in terms of the pandemic and everything that happened, how did that affect your business and, and your personal life? Mm. I think that what we were saying before, I think it has opened a lot of opportunities and, and it has made us kind of challenge uh, the, the, the way we work. And, and, but also many things that before we thought they were not possible, uh, now they are. No? Like uh, I think that I have been attending site visits online, which before you would say, wow, a site visit, you really need to be there. Mm. No. You can mm. do it online as well, it works. Uh, we have organized workshops on model making online, which again, before you would say, wow, a model making workshop without them seeing what you do and without you being there, it's going to be impossible. But no, it works. And it, it, like we, we organized one model making workshop with the university, with us being in London and the students being at the university. And it was also really successful. So I think that it has opened uh, a lot of doors and it has kind of forced us to, 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 to think further. And I think that that will bring a lot of positive aspects. So to me, it's been, despite the horrible situation that we are living, it's been a, an opportunity to explore different ways of working, basically. Yeah, I actually heard that from quite a few people, interior designers and the stage and uh, uh, the mm -hmm. same. So they, they essentially say, like, like you said, there was a one, a one interior designer on our podcast and she was saying that she, she was still getting uh, plenty of inquiries for, you know, online and uh, from Middle East and then there was some somewhere else. So, and she said, normally they, they would want you to, to come over and you know, take a flight and go and meet them and talk to them. And nowadays it's just literally, you know, one Zoom call away and, and you, you have like a prospect that, that you can um, yeah, totally, look, at, totally. look into. And uh, with the state agents, the same thing. So, uh, I mean, now it kind of got back to normal. But before, when they've closed everything down for like a couple of months, um, what they did is uh, they had the virtual tours. So like if you want to rent a property or buy a property, they would do these like special, special uh, videos and photos where you can just essentially walk, uh, you know, mm -hmm. using that technology. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with it. And, and it's very, it's very helpful. You literally don't need to, because I, you know, I, I, I've, I've checked that. So you, you, you can check that, um, you can use that and, and check all kinds of places like spas and hotels and, you know, property in general. And uh, yeah, I think I think it's um, it's something that wasn't there or wasn't that widespread until the until obviously circumstances just forced us to do these things. And uh, I, I think it's for the best, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah totally. And we, I think that also, for instance, in our in our case, that the the work that we do at the university has been really easy to reach people that before you thought they were not possible to reach. To invite people for lectures or and and almost anyone that we have reached, they were super interested into coming to the university. And we had been talking with the former colleague that lives in Argentina and is an expert in passive house design. And he gave a super lovely lecture. And before that was impossible because when you go to uni to bring somebody to the university is an effort, people don't have that much time. But now, even if you have half an hour or one hour, you just like log in do your kind of presentation lecture and then you can continue into something else so i think that like that that kind of opening the approach of like people being much more reachable and knowledge being more accessible is also quite a, is, is, is something that is happening like because of the situation yeah so what, what what's your what's your plan for the next 12 months or maybe next five years as well what's your mm -hmm. short short term and long-term plan what, what are you 
obviously you're gonna you're gonna uh, have a full time position in the university, uh, hopefully, and then yes. uh, so what are you what are you gonna do with the business? I'm starting that soon, and I will I will continue with the with the with the workshops and with the with the work that we do uh, in in parallel. Uh, and uh, my intention is more and more trying to combine both. So getting our students to uh, create and to and to design as much as possible with their hands. And we look forward to the workshops opening next year, which is something that we have missed quite a lot this year and to develop a kind of uh, experimental models and prototypes with the, with the students. And I think that uh, a five year time, uh, I think that probably I would like to kind of uh, reach out to a wider audience, uh, being able to uh, welcome more people into our workshops and uh, get more people interested into the world of making that we are trying to promote. Awesome. What about um, in UK? Are you planning to open like a studio uh, where you're going to have like a sim similar things happening uh, like in, in um, Santander? Uh, we, we have done uh, shorter kind of versions of what we do in Santander, always in collaboration with different institutions. And I think that in London, there are so many fantastic places already available. And it's so difficult to rent uh, workshops that uh, whenever we try, whenever we have to do uh, either a workshop or an installation or a collaboration, we always reach out to institutions that we know that they have spaces available and we do it in collaboration with them. And I think that that's quite an interesting model that is being also promoted through the London Festival of Architecture because a lot of institutions, they have buildings that are with very little exposure. And just by doing small installations or by bringing creative people into these, bu these buildings and, and, and having them intervene on the buildings, you get a lot of audience interested into what you are doing. So I think that for, for, for us in London, we always try to try to go out of the workshop and, you know, like uh, get, get, get uh, other institutions uh, involved into the process as well. Perfect, perfect. Okay, uh, uh, if you can just uh, tell us, uh, tell our audience how, how they can reach, uh, obviously, you know, I'm sure a lot of people would want advice from you and, and work with you. Um, what, what, what is the easiest way for them to contact you? Well, they can, we have our contact in our website. Uh, and we have an Instagram account as well, both for our work and the work that we are doing on the university. So with the, the Instagram for the university's uh, unit8.uel and the instant for our work is Atelier La Juntana. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, well, that, that's great. So thanks very much for your time. Uh, yeah, I had a great time speaking to you. It was very, very unusual topics and uh, very, very cool. I, I liked it a lot. Uh, you know, ho hope it's the same with you. Thanks thanks for your expertise and, and, and you know, your life stories. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful experience. Appreciate it. Thank you.